Well, let's pray together. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your rich gifts to us in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the reminder of his death for us, his resurrection for us, his ascension for us, that you have, through him, reconciled men and women to yourself. We thank you for the gifts you've given We thank you for the opportunity we've had this week to reflect on the gift of your spirit and the way in which being united to your son through him, we have all the blessings of all that Jesus has done. And so this morning, as we turn our attention again to the work of your spirit, as we uh, hear our brother come and uh, expound uh, your word to us and and teach us again from your word uh, the wonder of your gift, We pray that you might fill us with wonder and joy. We pray that you might not only stretch our minds, but enliven our hearts. And we pray, Father, that um, edified by that which you have given, we might live as your faithful people. Uh, We pray for our brother as he comes after a a long couple of weeks of teaching here um, each day. We pray that you might sustain him. We pray that you might give him an alertness, bring back to his mind all the things that he has studied. And we pray, Father, that you might richly bless him as you bless us through him. So, Father, we commit this time uh, that we spend now to your hands uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join with me in welcoming Professor Horton? Thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks especially to the Thompson family, which I've had the pleasure of being a part of for the last uh, two weeks. Uh, It's been a real pleasure to get to know faculty and staff here and uh, their families as well. Uh, There is a a real uh, close kinship between uh, our two seminaries, uh, Westminster Seminary, California, with Moore College. And... uh, I've known that over the years just by writing, but you don't really know people and places by, by uh, the, the work uh, that their scholars do. It's been a real pleasure to be here, and I get to take that back to, to my colleagues and tell them it's exactly what we thought it was, and uh, a really rich, uh, rewarding time spent here with all of you. Uh, we're concluding today, obviously, uh, this series that I have the pleasure of uh, bringing on the Holy Spirit. Spirit and the Bride today, Uh, since nothing I've said has been controversial or controverted, uh, I thought today I would uh, depart from the commonplace. Uh, Whenever we talk about the the Spirit's relationship to that which is concrete, particular, specific, uh, less abstract, uh, less sweeping, uh, less global in its analysis, uh, we run into differences. The more particular, the more specific, the more applied it is, the more uh, we have questions and uh, reach sometimes different conclusions. By now, you've probably had enough of my uh, repeated references to the trail that leads from the spirit hovering over the waters of creation, exodus, tabernacle, indwelling of the temple, then overshadowing Mary's womb to clothe the eternal son in our flesh and then join Jesus in his messianic ministry. We've seen the Spirit hovering over Jesus in his baptism, (coughs) enveloping Jesus and his disciples with Moses and Elijah, speaking of his exodus that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem, then descending at Pentecost to indwell his people and to empower them for witness and to indwell them as a deposit. Of course, relevant passages could be multiplied. We could have spent time on Ezekiel 37, for example, where the prophet is told to preach to the the, the dead bones. Uh, many of us feel like sometimes we have had that congregation to preach to. Uh, and what's so amazing there is uh, here Israel lying in exile is raised in the vision that he has raised by God's unilateral act of, of grace through the preaching uh, of the Son of Man. And so the Holy Spirit is turning a vast cemetery into a church triumphant in these last days. Recall Calvin's line about the Holy Spirit in creation. He cherishes the confused mass even as he begins to mold it. Even before it it has that organization 
and order and beauty. He cherishes the confused mass, and that is equally true in his creation formation of the church. The church has often been polarized by institutional formalism and egalitarian enthusiasm. The Spirit's work is seen either as bound by the church's ministry or liberated from the church's ministry. But whether it's the inflated ego of the autonomous church or that of the autonomous believer, the result is the same. A refusal to submit ourselves to the disorienting and disturbing judgment of the only one who can bring us life, real life, eschatological life, from the age to come, where Christ is already the king. Now, we've looked a little bit, uh, granted not too much, at the covenantal foundations of the Spirit's uh, work in these last days. Uh, it is the treaty of the great king, the treaty particularly of the covenant of grace, that is uh, sealed, finally ratified in Christ's death on the cross, and that goes into effect. It's that uh, last will and testament uh, that serves as the context for the Spirit's work in our lives and in the church today. The treaty is the gospel itself. Jesus giving his life for us. And the ratification of that treaty would be baptism and the Lord's Supper, just as circumcision and Passover were ratifying the treaty in the Old Covenant. Also, we've seen the importance of eschatology as a coordinate for our understanding of the Spirit in these last days. We have to live in the tension where the Spirit himself puts us, the tension between the already and the not yet. It would be easier to have an over-realized eschatology where we perhaps didn't need the Spirit or even invoked the Spirit as a sort of realized kind of eschatology where the church simply is the kingdom of God. Or it would be easier to take the position of a, a, a wholly unrealized eschatology uh, where there is little call to deal with the messiness of a visible church on earth. But we live in that tension between the already and the not yet. The reformers properly identified the church as a creature of the word. And they did so over a papal uh, over against a papal church that held exactly the reverse thesis, namely that the word was the creature of the church. The Bible is the church's book. Uh, it is the church that comes before the word. Yet they also deployed this maxim against the Anabaptists. If Rome reduces the Spirit's work to its magisterial agency, the radicals separate the Spirit's work from the ordinary ministry of the visible church. For radical Protestantism, the platonic dualism between matter and spirit was mapped onto the New Testament contrast between flesh and spirit. And we've seen that flesh and spirit does not uh, cash out as a platonic dualism at all. Flesh refers to the powers of this present age to bring about that new creation that God promises. Spirit refers to that which comes from heaven, namely God and God's power to create the future that he's promised. And so in radical Protestantism, everything external, ordered, ordinary, structured, and official was man-made, as opposed to the internal, spontaneous, extraordinary, informal, and individual testimony of the spirit within. It's my impression that many of the best and brightest evangelical and Pentecostal theologians today, in the United States at least, uh, are eager to harvest insights from a whole variety of ecclesiological tradition, ecclesiastical traditions today. You read some of the, the really most interesting, uh, especially I'm thinking of Pentecostal theologians. Uh, they, they interact at great length and sophistication with the Roman Catholic tradition, with the Eastern Orthodox tradition, uh, with their own history. Uh, but they, they don't wrestle at all 
with the Reformation. It's as if the Reformation didn't have an ecclesiological position that differed from Rome and the Anabaptists. That may be largely due to a deficiency in some versions of contemporary Reformed theology, but I think it overlooks the remarkable integration of pneumatology and ecclesiology that the Reformation clearly represents and that even Roman Catholic historians recognize and observe. Calvin has been called the theologian of the Holy Spirit, not only by B.B. Warfield, uh, clearly a uh, disciple, uh, but also by uh, Alexander Genoxi, a Roman Catholic theologian. And uh, part of that was due to the controversy over the Lord's Supper that Calvin uh, took part in with the other reformers and with Rome and the Anabaptists on either side. Rather than see the spirit and the church as two pans of an old-fashioned scale where the one falls to the degree that the other rises, Calvin seems convinced that a biblical pneumatology is essential for a biblical ecclesiology and vice versa. Undoubtedly, again, the debates over the Lord's Supper refined Calvin's thinking here of the intersection of pneumatology and ecclesiology, but I think it also comes out of his understanding of and appreciation for uh, union with Christ. Repeatedly, on every topic that I can think of, Calvin invokes the Chalcedonian maxim, distinction without separation. This was originally applied uh, to the two natures of Christ united in one person. Uh, distinguish the two natures, don't confuse them, but also don't separate them. Don't fall into monophysitism on one end or Nestorianism on the other. And Calvin applies that Chalcedonian maxim across every theological topic. When it comes to the relation of the spirit and the church, the word and the spirit, the sacramental union of sign and reality in baptism and the supper, and a host of other key questions on the topic, distinction without separation, is uh, the way forward, Calvin believes. Now, we'll see that more concretely as we go along. In this lecture, I'm going to be appealing to Calvin more than I have throughout the series. Not because I think Calvin was the great phoenix rising from the ashes of the Middle Ages, uh, you know, who, who suddenly rediscovered uh, uh, everything that, that eluded everyone else. Uh, Calvin's views were very representative of the Reformed in general. Uh, his colleagues, his predecessors, and successors. Uh, nevertheless, it, uh, he said it so well and summarized it so helpfully. All right, the spirit and the means of grace. Notice it's not the spirit versus the means of grace, or the spirit or the means of grace, but the spirit and the means of grace. When it came to the relationship of the spirit and the means of grace, Roman Catholic theologian Eve Congar accurately summarizes, Luther and Calvin both kept to a middle road or rather a synthesis and each in his own way insisted on a close relationship between an external instrument of grace and the activity of the spirit without blurring them completely. And I think that's exactly uh, what, I, what I'm saying Calvin did with the, the maxim distinction without separation. I think uh, Congar was exactly right in his description. Now, there are, of course, a lot of different ways of domesticating the Holy Spirit. In other words, imagining that he's an employee of the individual, the spirit-filled individual or the spirit-filled church. Uh, we can do this in, in all sorts of ecclesiologies. I can't think of one ecclesiology that makes it impossible for us to domesticate the spirit if we really want to do it. Both the Eastern Orthodox and Protestants have suspected Rome of assimilating the Spirit's person and work to the ministrations of the papal hierarchy. The work of the church simply is the work of the Spirit. Yet Orthodox theology, that is Eastern Orthodox theology, is susceptible to taking the Spirit for granted by appealing to an allegedly unbroken tradition from the first five centuries. There has to be greater appreciation for the already not yet tension that the word and sacraments themselves underscore. 
In fact, it's this ministry of these means of grace that places us not in glory and over-realized eschatology. You know, orthodoxy teaches that the, that the, the supper is the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is a fully realized uh, uh, event in which we are uh, participating in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, that's a pretty important view if you think that that, that is a controlling motif for our ecclesiology. Uh, yet the real absence of Jesus uh, from the supper is an underrealized eschatology. Uh, how is the Holy Spirit then present? How is the Holy Spirit using these means to fulfill his uh, work? The bottom line is that, that we can all do this. Lutheran and, and Reformed churches confess that the Spirit is active wherever the word is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly administered. But this too can be a way of domesticating the Spirit and saying we have the Spirit. We don't need to invoke the Spirit around here. We don't need to, to call on the Spirit to bless our ministrations. Our ministrations simply are the Spirit's work because we have the word and we have the sacraments instead of the Spirit having us through the word and the sacraments. Despite their emphasis on the freedom of the Spirit from external forms and institutions, Pentecostal and charismatic movements evolve their own institutional forms that can put the Spirit at their disposal as well. A revival can be planned. Uh, it can be staged. Uh, the 19th century revivalist Charles Finney placed the spirit qu squarely within the control of the individual by saying that we must divide, quote, methods calculated to induce the greatest number of conversions. He added, a revival is not a miracle or dependent on a miracle in any sense, but is simply the philosophical result of the right use of techniques. Very American. In more extreme cases, Finney's pragmatic reasoning is taken to its logical extreme by many neo-Pentecostal faith teachers today, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, many others, who really suggest that it's entirely in our hands whether we will have our healing or whether we will uh, have the money come to us or the new house or the new car. It's sort of a deism, ironically, a hyper-spiritualism that in actual fact, is a deism that says basically God is the great architect who set the spiritual universe up this way, and, and then uh, he went on holiday. And now it's basically us, up to us to push the right buttons, fulfill the right procedures, and therefore cause the right effects. In all these ways, there's a common weakness. We can assume, at least in practice, that if we believe the right things or do the right things, whether they're ordinary or extraordinary, whether they are commanded in Scripture or not commanded, the Spirit is in our control, like the genie in Aladdin's lamp. There is no ecclesiology good enough to save us from having to invoke the Holy Spirit every time we gather. It is the Holy Spirit who makes holy common things. On the other hand, as we've seen, the Holy Spirit does work within creation, dividing and uniting. He doesn't work against nature, but within nature. Although he can't be imprisoned in church order and offices, there are clearly church orders and offices in the New Testament. And he's the one who is at work within them to make them something other than a piece of paper in a file somewhere. The Holy Spirit ordinarily binds his work to common means. And that's because he makes Christ haveable for us. He places Christ squarely within our hands through tangible means that we can actually touch, hear, and smell. Recall especially the Spirit's role in the incarnation in this regard. Some Anabaptists following Balthazar Hubmeyer, taught that the Son assumed celestial flesh from heaven, the teaching of Menno Simons, founder of the Mennonites, and John Alasco and, and Calvin offered pointed refutations of this view, which they identified as Gnostic and Docetic. 
They invoke the rule of Gregory of Nazianzus. What has not been assumed has not been healed. Only by assuming everything that we are as human beings could he redeem everything that we are as human beings. It's not surprising that a Christology that tends to assimilate the eschatological, vertical, God to us, tends to assimilate the eschatological register to the horizontal, historical register, would affirm something like the dogma of transubstantiation in the Eucharist. The sign simply becomes the reality signified. Eschatology, the event where the Holy Spirit blesses by being invoked, he blesses common things and makes them holy, isn't really necessary because the priest has the, the new quality by ordination to perform the miracle. It also makes sense that a docetic Christology would separate the divine and heavenly Christ from our human history and therefore separate the reality, Christ with all of his gifts, from the sign, any preaching or sacrament as a creaturely means. If you're going to pit the historical Jesus against the heavenly Jesus, it makes sense you're going to pit the earthly signs against the heavenly reality. But because the union of the eternal son with our humanity was complete, the Reformed argued, there is a visible church enduring from generation to generation that shares in his history. By using historical means, the Holy Spirit brings about a church that is in history, but not of it. It is from above, and yet endures from generation to generation. So if you want to know where the Holy Spirit is at work anywhere in the world today, don't look for the high places. Look for the low places. Look for the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, or hanging on a cross. Wherever the Spirit is present through the preaching of the Word and the administration of the sacraments, there is a church. It's the Spirit who made the, the eternal Son haveable in his incarnation, and it's the Spirit who makes him haveable for us now. And the first instance of that that we come to is the word. The first means the spirit uses to make Christ haveable for us here and now is his word. And this is the argument in Romans 10, right? Paul says, the righteousness which is by works says, how can I climb up and bring him down? Or how can I dive, deep sea dive into the depths to bring him up from the dead? How can I make him alive and real in my life? Or in this movement? Or in my neighborhood? How can I whirl him out of heaven or go into the depths to pull him up from the dead? But Paul says the righteousness which is of faith doesn't speak like this. The righteousness which is by faith doesn't ascend or descend. It sits down and receives him where he is promised to be, namely in his word. For he is as close as the word of faith, Paul says, that we are preaching. It's amazing. Jesus is as near to us as that word that is preached. He gave us his word. Jesus Christ, of course, is the very word of God in his very essence. But we also speak of God's word as the living and active energies that go forth from the Father in the Son by the Spirit that create, uphold, judge, deliver, redeem, and consummate. Creation is frequently attributed to God's speech, and the new creation is also attributed to his speech. Bottom line, the, the Holy Trinity is a preacher. This God we worship is a preacher. He preaches things into existence. His speech created a text, the so-called book of nature, creation, that we can, we can, we can read. Beyond this, after the fall, he proclaimed the gospel and fulfilled that gospel in his son. And God still speaks this saving word today, making light shine in the darkness of sin and death. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 that I read yesterday. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's a new ex nihilo creation. God speaks it in the Son by the Spirit. This saving speech has also generated a text, the book of Scripture. Christ alone is the word in his essence. The scriptures alone are the inerrant canon and constitution for faith and practice and the source and norm for all that we preach today. And it's because the scriptures come from the Father that they're trustworthy. But that's not enough. It's because they speak of Christ also that they have their authority. But that's not enough. It's also because the Holy Spirit perfectly completes the process of inspiration. The, the Holy Spirit perfectly preserves and cares for that which is human. The confused mass of our language, our, our distortions, whatever it is, and is able to turn a house into a home, is able to beautify, to divide, to separate, to order, to bring everything to completion in such a way that the words the words, the frail words of human beings are actually, in fact, the very word of God. But my focus here is the preached word. Calvin called this the verbum sacramentale, the sacramental word, because it's the word as a means of grace. Typically, when the reformers are talking about the word being saving, they're not talking about reading the Bible. They're talking about preaching. Preaching had first place. Scripture norms our preaching. Unless preaching is, is normed by Scripture, it isn't the preaching of the Word of God. But if it is normed by Scripture, it is primarily through the, the preaching of the Word of God that faith comes. We've seen how God's speech took two forms in the creation narrative. The fiat declaration, let there be... And there was. And then the utterance, let the earth bring forth with the report, and the earth brought forth. And, and we, when, we, when we think of these categories, uh, uh, it's helpful to apply them, I think, to uh, what goes on in preaching. Remember, God says, Isaiah 55, 11, his speech will never return unto him void without accomplishing every purpose for which it's, he sent it. Not because God is coercive, a coercive Unitarian Allah, but because he's the Trinity, because he's the Father in the Son, by the Spirit, bringing everything to completion. Sometimes this divine speech creates life from nothing, even against God's uh, righteousness, as in our new creation. It's no wonder that Paul compares regeneration in 2 Corinthians 4.6 and justification in Romans 4.17 to an ex nihilo type of creation. And yet the regenerate and justified believer begins immediately to yield the fruit of the Spirit, let the earth bring forth. But that too is the result of the powerful energies of the Spirit, working through the Word, always working through the Word, never apart from the Word. Both types of speech acts occur through preaching. God is a preacher. That's just how he creates and redeems. And that's why Reformed theology typically speaks of the preached gospel as the word of God. Of course, God is doing other things in preaching uh, than, than raising the dead. He's also instructing, teaching, exhorting. But I fear that in some of our circles, at least the ones I know back home, our tendency is to reduce preaching to teaching, to instruction, or exhortation. This is an understandable reaction against both liberal romanticism and a Pentecostal uh, charismatic emphasis on revelation, sometimes even outside of scripture. But we risk pushing people into these extremes by the implied conclusion that the Spirit doesn't speak today, he spoke once upon a time long ago. And, and what we really need is a robust, robust sense of the Spirit speaking today through the means that he's provided. In preaching, Christ is present here and now. 
not only in Romans 10, but in so many other places. Scripture tells us that we can be confident that where the, the word of God is preached, Christ is there. Regeneration comes through the preaching of the gospel. We read in numerous places. Of course, the canon isn't being amended by further revelation. But in preaching, Christ is addressing us in judgment and justification. Renewal, conforming us to the image of Christ. The pulpit, brothers and sisters, is the great throne from which the ascended king creates and sustains his expanding kingdom. This is Paul's point in Romans 10, 6 through 17, that I've uh, referred to a moment ago. It is the word of Christ himself. The word, uh, the word of the preacher is, if it is normed by Holy Scripture, the word of the preacher is the word of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is addressing us through the lips of another sinner. So is preaching simply information about God? about his work, about his will, or is it the means by which God is now, here in this place, working his will, fulfilling his purpose, displaying his attributes? It's the reduction of preaching to human talk about God rather than a medium of God's talk to us, I think, that pushes people to look for words from the Lord in all the wrong places. Of course, the reformers emphasized the importance of reading scripture. Uh, Luther created the modern German language uh, out of translating the Bible into German. Uh, Calvin uh, was certainly uh, concerned about having bubble, uh, Bibles in every public uh, tavern. He had them chained. Uh, there in every public tavern, knowing that that's probably where people spent more time than church. And yet, as Luther put it, the church is a mouth house, not a pen house. The church is a mouth house, not a pen house. B.A. Garish observes, Calvin felt no antagonism between what we may call the pedagogical teaching uh, and sacramental functions of the word. God's word for Calvin is not simply a dogmatic norm. It has in it a vital efficacy, and it is the appointed instrument by which the Spirit imparts illumination, faith, awakening, regeneration, purification, and so on. Calvin describes the word as verbum sacramentale, the sacramental word, because it is this word that gives even to the sacraments their efficacy. It's interesting that Theodore Beza, in his uh, uh, confession of faith uh, that he, he drew up uh, at the beginning of the section on the sacraments uh, begins the word of God. The first sacrament being the preaching of the word of God. The word of God is a means of grace. Listen to the second Helvetic confession written by Heinrich Bollinger in Zurich. The preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Wherefore, when this word of God is now preached in the church by preachers lawfully called, we believe that the very word of God is heard and received by the faithful, and that neither any other word of God is to be invented nor is to be expected from heaven, and that now the word itself which is preached is to be regarded never the minister who preaches. We kind of have it backwards in America. For even if he is evil and a sinner... The word of God remains still true and pure. It's amazing. The objectivity of the word of God, the, the proclamation of the word of God, even if the, uh, even if the preacher himself doesn't believe it, whatever he proclaims, that is in fact consistent with the scriptural canon, makes alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. Specifically, the gospel is that part of the word that gives life. 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25, it's the word that gives us birth spiritually, Peter says. I mean the word of grace that was preached to you. Romans 10, 6 through 17, we're told uh, that the word of faith, it is 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's, it's crucial to understand that for Calvin, preaching is not an invitation or exhortation to be united to Christ. It is the means through which the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ. He actually descends to us to place himself in our hands. And the medium by which he does that is the Holy Spirit. The Westminster Larger Catechism explains, The Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the Word of God, an effectual means of enlightening, convincing, and humbling sinners by driving them out of themselves and drawing them unto Christ. It's absolutely key. It's not just the message that drives us outside of ourselves, screaming from from the terrors of God's wrath to cling to Jesus Christ for safety. It's the medium that fits with that message. Preaching calls us out of ourselves. When people say uh, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves, I I say, well, that's better than preaching other things, I guess, to yourself. Uh, But you really can't preach the gospel to yourself very well. You have to have another sinner sent in Christ's name proclaiming it to you because you don't really believe it. As Calvin says, we're partly unbelievers till we die. And so we need to have this gospel preached to us every week. It's something that an inner word just cannot do. We're, we lie. We're inveterate liars. We lie about the law and we lie about the gospel. We do not tell ourselves the truth. And so we need to hear it from someone who is proclaiming on the basis of scripture what God says about us. Drives us out of ourselves. And furthermore, because it drives us out of ourselves, it drives us out of ourselves to look up in faith to God, to cling to Christ in faith, and out to our brothers and sisters in love. Instead of driving us deeper and deeper, as even the medium of reading can do. You know this, you're in seminary. It's drive you deeper and deeper and take you away from the community. Away from brothers and sisters. I'm not against reading. But without the preaching of the word of God, that reading will become increasingly individualistic and introspective. Preaching is a social event, and that is how God creates a church. An inner word creates an inner church. A social word proclaimed to people who are not related at all, and then after they hear this and embrace it, find themselves brothers and sisters. That creates a new community in a world of sin and death. And now, even when we read scripture in private, we're reading it with the whole church, shaped by a public confession of what the scriptures teach. So the church is a creation of the word. It's not the creation of itself, either in a Roman Catholic corporate view or an Anabaptist individualist view. The church does not arise because of the believing act of the many or because of the believing act of the one. The church comes into being because of the speaking act of the triune God from the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. And now to turn to the signs and seals, uh, baptism and the supper as covenantal ratification. According to Calvin, Rome binds God to earthly means, while the Anabaptists don't allow that God can freely bind himself to them. That's the key. Rome binds God to earthly means, while the Anabaptists don't think God can freely bind himself to them in his ordinary way of working. He says, Scripture teaches that preaching and the sacraments are instruments, while the Spirit remains the agent. And to convey that that idea of delivering Christ to us, the Holy Spirit delivering Christ to us through these means, Calvin often uses the verb exhibere, uh, which means to present, to to confer, to deliver. 
The same view is expressed uh, later in the 39 Articles and in the Westminster Standards, Standards, the latter referring to the sacraments as effectual means of salvation. Those who tend to pit the internal word against the external word also tend to draw unbiblical contrast between an external baptism and an internal baptism and to turn the supper into a merely individual and introspective contemplation. So Zwingli, for example, says, just believe and you have eaten. It's an internal eating uh, that matters without the external partaking of the bread and the cup. But since the triune God is the agent of redemption, we must seek him only where and how he has promised to meet us, in grace rather than judgment very important that we that we that we realize that God has promised to meet us in grace rather than judgment and so we we dare not come up with our own observances our own means of grace as with preaching the Westminster Shorter Catechism says in question 91 the sacraments become effectual means of salvation not from any virtue in them or in them that doth administer them, but only by the blessing of Christ and the working of his Holy Spirit in them that by faith receive them. As Louis Burkhoff explains this view, God is not absolutely bound to them, but ordinarily binds himself to them. It's a typical phrase that you get in uh, Reformed treatments of the subject. The sacramental union of sign and reality isn't a fusion of substances. Rather, it is a relative or relational action of God within a covenantal economy. In other words, it's sort of like the ring in a wedding ceremony. It's what, it's what is done with the ring, not what the ring is or becomes in itself. The sacraments are God's instruments of pledging and confirming. As Burkhoff adds, the close connection between the sign and the thing signified explains the use of what is generally called sacramental language in which in scripture the sign is put for the thing signified or vice versa, as in Genesis 17.10, Acts 22.16, 1 Corinthians 5.7, where, for example, the, the circumcision is just called the covenant, <laughs> where the... the uh, uh, the bread and the cup in the upper room are called uh, my body and my blood. While the work that the Spirit does in building Christ's church is different from other labors, what he does and the way that he does it remains consistent with what we've come to expect based on the other, cha the, the other uh, uh, chapters of redemptive history that we've explored. For Calvin and the Reformed tradition generally, the ascension of Christ not only continues Christ's threefold office on our behalf in heaven, but opens up a space in history for the descent of the Holy Spirit. In his natural body, this is getting a little technical, but in his natural body, the body that was born uh, from the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ is taken away from us by the ascension. But only so the Spirit can unite us to him as part of his ecclesial body in an even greater sense than, than, than we ever could have been, been united to him while he was still on earth. And the way he does this is by uniting the, the creaturely signs of human words, ordinary bread, ordinary water, ordinary wine, to the reality they signify. The ecclesial body, the church, never replaces the natural body, Jesus. Rather, the Holy Spirit unites that which is separated in space. It's very easy to see how different views of the Spirit's work through the means of grace generate different ecclesiological paradigms. In Roman Catholic ecclesiology, the tendency is to confuse things that ought to be distinguished. In Anabaptist ecclesiologies, to separate 
what God has joined together. Those are generalizations, but I think generalizations that hold better than most uh, generalizations. So very, very quickly here to wind up uh, uh, summarizing uh, the supper. I'm going to start with the supper because uh, uh, this is really where you see reformed pneumatology intersecting ecclesiology most obviously. Uh, very, very quickly, the, the history of this, you, you, I'm sure already know you have great uh, church historians here. 1529, the unfortunate meeting of Luther and Zwingli uh, in Marburg. They agreed to uh, 15 out of 16 points. The 16th point was the way Christ is present in the Lord's Supper. Luther tended to collapse the humanity of Christ into his deity or, or view the deity of Christ as somehow capable of making his humanity omnipresent. And Zwingli thought that that was obvious monophysitism, confusing what ought to be distinguished, confusing the two natures of Christ. And so the good news is Christ is present at the altar everywhere the, the Lord's Supper is celebrated. The bad news is his body is nothing like <laughs> what it was when it was born of the Virgin Mary. So his Eucharistic presence is so different from any human presence that we associate with the past, Jesus born of the Virgin Mary, and the future, the return of Jesus in the flesh. For his part, Zwingli thought that Luther's conception turned Jesus into what he called a monstrous phantasm, rather than the one who nursed at Mary's breast. There is no sense in which it's proper to speak of Jesus Christ returning bodily to the earth prior to his parousia. The church can't control Christ's bodily return by the ringing of a bell. Luther says, okay, fair enough, but he can be present even in his humanity wherever he decrees by his sovereign word. At this juncture, Zwingli took the bodily ascension of Christ seriously and the bodiliness of Christ seriously. However, following ancient precedent, Augustine, for example, he argued our Lord's ascension finally allowed the church to cling not to his humanity, but to his divinity that is omnipresent. Oh, there are all kinds of ways you can get out of, the, out of running to Pentecost, you know, uh, sort of not taking the, uh, the Zwingli stops at the ascension as if that's the last that's the last moment in redemptive history. So Zwingli thought he had solved the problem. Jesus isn't present in the sacrament according to his human nature, but that doesn't matter because that's not the saving part anyway. He's present according to his omnipresent deity, which is the saving part. And this is a step beyond Augustine when he writes. Christ is our salvation by virtue of that part of his nature by which he came down from heaven, not of that by which he was born of the Immaculate Virgin, though he had to suffer and die by that part. No wonder Luther said, you're a Nestorian. That sentence is a Nestorian sentence. Calvin, poor guy. A generation younger than both entered the debate as a disciple of Martin Bootser, friend of Philip Melanchthon, Luther's sidekick, relating that he'd never read Zwingli until now, and he was confused and frustrated with Zwingli's views at many points as he was beginning to read it. He told Bullinger, Zwingli's successor, if a comparison has to be made, you yourself know how much Luther is to be preferred. Zwingli's view of the supper, he writes to another friend, is wrong and pernicious. Most basically, Calvin fears that Zwingli's view strikes at the heart of our union with Christ saving humanity, which is so central to his thinking about union with Christ and eschatology. It goes to the heart of his Christology. Carl Truman, I think, isn't far off the mark when he says uh, not only Luther and Zwingli, but Calvin and Zwingli had fundamentally different Christologies. Calvin says it would be extreme madness 
to recognize no communion of believers with the flesh and blood of Christ. Extreme madness, because that's how we're saved. It's not just by his omnipresent deity. It's that union that we share with him by the Holy Spirit that we have salvation. With Luther, Calvin agreed that salvation depends on our union with Christ. The whole Christ, not just his divine nature. For, Calvin says, in his flesh he accomplished our redemption. Furthermore, he says, the gift is Jesus Christ himself. Not only his divinity, but the whole Christ. His gifts are inseparable from his person. When we receive the bread and the wine, let us no less surely trust that the body and blood of Christ are given to us. The signs are guarantees of a present reality. Not memories of a past reality. Guarantees of a present reality. The believers feeding on the body and blood of Christ. Otherwise, Calvin concludes, faith is a mere imagining of Christ's presence than his presence. So with Zwingli, Calvin took the ascension seriously. But then he said, but Zwingli, there are other passages. Just as you think Luther overlooked some passages, you overlooked some passages. How does Jesus say, even though I'm leaving, I will be with you? How does Jesus say, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you? How does Jesus say, I will be with you even to the end of the age? How does Paul say, this bread that we break is a participation in Christ. This cup that we bless is a participation in the blood of Christ. Because you don't affirm that, Zwingli, you actually don't go to Pentecost, to the work of the Holy Spirit, but stay at the ascension with the lost memory of a founder who is gone. And so, Calvin faces the ascension, but also takes just as seriously his promise to be with his church to the end of the age. The only way Christ can be with his church while he in the flesh is reigning at the right hand of the Father for us now is by his Holy Spirit whom he has sent. And so it's just at this point where Calvin went beyond Luther and Zwingli. All of the participants in the debate, Rome, Luther, Zwingli, all of the participants in the debate were arguing about how Christ is present or not present at the altar on earth. Calvin changed the subject to how Christ is present and is truly given to us while remaining in heaven at the right hand of the Father in his flesh. And yet, he is truly given the whole Christ, not just, not just uh, the spirit of Jesus, not just his omnipresent divinity, the whole Christ, body and blood, given to us by the work of the Holy Spirit. So what we receive, what we receive is exactly what Rome says we receive. Exactly what Luther says we receive. Francis Turretin says there is no difference between, uh, between us on what we receive. The question is how we receive it. We receive it by the Holy Spirit. It's not the presence that is spiritual. The presence is real as we feed on Christ in heaven, but it's by the Holy Spirit. The mode is spiritual, as the 39 articles say. But by a mode, we receive the body and blood of Christ. 39 articles say, but by a mode which is spiritual, that is the Holy Spirit. So where Zwingli said that at his ascension, uh, that, that, that Christ's ascension is to our advantage because of his omnipresent deity that is now recognized, Jesus himself said, it's good that I go because I'll send the Holy Spirit. Calvin recognized that and it made all the difference in his Christology and ecclesiology and his view of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And again, all of this is evident already in his understanding of Paul's teaching on union with Christ, where we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So where Luther has this great emphasis on God's descent to us, theology of the cross, Calvin also recognizes, while affirming that wholeheartedly, 
an ascent, not our ascending, but an ascent by the Spirit where we are lifted up uh, to where we are seated with Christ in heavenly places to feed on him. Is Christ present truly in the sacrament? Yes, but not on earth. He's present truly in the sacrament because the Holy Spirit takes what is separate in space and makes it ours. He will take what is mine, Jesus says, and declare it unto you. Really, the key here is koinonia in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The bread that we break is a koinonia in participation or fellowship in the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And, and that is exactly how Paul talks about in the passage that Ed read for us earlier. That is exactly how Paul talks about the communion of the saints. What we believe about the the sacrament of communion tells us a lot about what kind of communion of the saints is generated from it. For Rome, we read, First Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church is a continuation of the life of Christ. It is his very continuation. At the other end, you have Zwingli, who is, is, is sort of uh, channeled through Karl Barth when he says the true church exists not as a historical institution, but only as an event when it happens. You see, there's a close connection between their view of how the Holy Spirit works, whether through means or apart from means, and their view of the kind of church that results. The church is not of this world because it's the Holy Spirit who makes the signs effective. Apart from the Holy Spirit's work, they're just common elements. They can't affect anything. But because the Holy Spirit uses common historical things that, we, that are common to us every day, the church does have a historical existence from generation to generation. For Rome, you can't lose a candlestick. Rome itself never has to fear that it might have its candlestick removed if it fails to preach the gospel or administer the sacraments according to Christ's institution. It doesn't have to invoke the Holy Spirit. It has the Holy Spirit. It's in the window behind Peter's chair. But the danger is that we react in the other direction and say that he can't really get to us through material things. You can't get spiritual things through material means, as Wingley argued. The answer here is koinonia. Just as God delivers by his Holy Spirit and seals to us his promise of his word, of his gospel, seals to us, ratifies his covenant treaty, his last will and testament, puts the seal on it with my name on it. When I receive that bread and I, and I drink of that cup, so too there is a koinonia not only between Christ and me vertically, but between myself and the rest of his body. Not a fusion, as in the Roman Catholic view, but also not a separation, as in the Anabaptist view, but a genuine unity in difference, distinction, without separation. I think that's the, that is one of the, the important insights that we have from uh, Reformed in, uh, 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 interpretations of the Spirit's work through the means of grace. The Spirit doesn't divinize matter. He sanctifies it. He doesn't have to divinize it. It doesn't have to be divine. There's only one reality. There's God and everything else. Angels aren't divine. Souls aren't divine. Only the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are divine. God is divine. Everything else is, is creaturely. The Spirit doesn't d divinize material means, but he sanctifies the most common every day <coughs> things of water, bread, wine, words for his purposes. And when he takes them into his hand, they become the sword of the Spirit. They become the seals of the Spirit. Let me conclude the whole series now um, in relation to this, the Holy Spirit, as we've seen, 
binds things together that otherwise fall apart. He makes saving connections. He separates us, not from the material world, but from the reign of sin and death, the grip that sin and death have on our world in this present evil age. First, he binds eternity to time by uniting Christ to our humanity and its history of death. And then raising Jesus beyond death as the eschatological last Adam so that the great exchange can take place, our death for his eschatological life. Second, by uniting us to Christ, he binds us to the Father as well as to the members of Christ's body and knits us together more and more in an intimate fellowship. The sacraments are not just repeat of, of remembering over and over again, but making us more and more the koinonia that the Holy Spirit creates in this world. At the same time, he binds local churches together in wider assemblies of counsel and fellowship. He binds Christ's promise to creaturely words, and he binds earthly elements to the reality they signify. Third, he binds the already of Christ's saving history to the not yet of the age to come. In short, he is the Erebon. He is the linchpin. He is the unifier of things that float apart, given by the Father and the Son as the pledge on our finer, final redemption. So many threads he's brought together to bring unity and order out of division and chaos. The church can't give birth to itself, either as a collection of individuals or as a hierarchical unity. The Spirit alone creates the church. New birth comes from above, and yet, because the Spirit works through appointed creaturely means, it is truly historical and it is truly visible. And wherever the word is proclaimed and the sacraments are administered according to Christ's appointment, there is a church. The Holy Spirit is active. That's where we know the Holy Spirit is active. No, no matter how small or insignificant, no matter how little the manger is with the swaddling clothes. There is a covenant com community that extends from generation to generation. Because the Pentecost sermon still resounds. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God calls to himself. And as we read at the end of the book, John relates, the spirit and the bride say come. And the one who has ears, let the one who has ears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life take it without price. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the water of life that gushes forth from your presence, eternally proceeding from you, breathed from you eternally. We thank you that he has been shed abroad in our hearts to give us a new beginning, a new creation, that we can see our hope secured by his indwelling presence as the Erebon, the, the down payment on the final possession. Father, we thank you for the goodness of what you've created. We're sorrowful over the, the horrible uh, pall that has been cast over this, this earth and this cosmos because of our sin. And we're grateful for you, to you for pulling back that sheet of death that covered us and breathing into us the breath of life so that we can be united not just to each other, but be united to each other in a way no community has ever been united because Christ is our head and the Spirit is our bond. Hear us, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to give uh, Mike just a moment to catch his breath after that. And then uh, we have one last time of questions. Uh, so here's the opportunity for you to ask those questions that you want to ask before he goes. I think I'd like to...
find out what he would have said about baptism if he'd had the time to say it. Um, but uh, we, if there's some space, he might do that. Um, first of all, Mike has some questions that were given at the end of the last lecture. And uh, would you like to answer those at the beginning? And then sure. we'll take questions from the floor. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I was seeing myself run out of time. And instead of starting a new subject, baptism, in for, to cover in three minutes, I... Uh, ran away. Um, <laughs> you mentioned a middle category between the saved and the lost from Hebrews 4, 6, 10, 12. Those among the Christian community who uh, won't enter God's eternal rest. However, you later men, uh, mentioned there are only two categories of union with Christ, in Christ or not in Christ. So which category of union with Christ do the middle ground people fit into? Are they united to Christ or not? Yeah, excellent uh, question. No, they are... Uh, the distinction is between being united publicly, visibly, by profession of faith. Professedly united to Christ. So we're all professedly united to Christ, uh, hoping, trusting that, that we're all elect. But there are people who are professedly united to Christ publicly by being united to his visible church, who are not united to Christ truly uh, through faith. And... Uh, there, there is a view out there that there are people who are united to Christ, uh, that, that everyone who is baptized is united to Christ, uh, and, and uh, apart from uh, any expression of faith, uh, that seems to, to be completely contrary, uh, in my view, to the teaching of the New Testament. Uh, it is by faith that we have a saving relationship to God and Jesus Christ. Uh, it, is, it is through faith that we are united to Christ with all of his benefits. But there are many people, many people who share in, we, we know these people, right? The people Hebrews 4 is talking about. We know people who've grown up in the church and they, they see, you say, I, how, could they, how could they have turned their back on Christ, they're the ones who led me to the Lord, or they're the ones who invited me to youth group, or they're the ones who you can remember. You can think of these people. There were moments when they they cried. They were weren't faking it. They were really overwhelmed with the greatness of God and His mercy in Jesus Christ. They tasted of the heavenly gift. They they were they were participants in the Holy Spirit's general work in the visible body, but they were not united to Christ in faith. And uh, uh, as Peter O'Brien was reminding me uh, uh, yesterday as we were talking about this, really uh, uh, a helpful analog here are the, the uh, parables of the soils. It's the same thing going on there. And so for now in the visible church, there are, there are weeds growing up among the wheat. And Jesus says, uh, don't pull them up before the time because they look a lot alike. <laughs> The elect and the reprobate look a lot alike. It's not our business to determine who's elect, even who's truly regenerate, truly born again. We have no authority uh, to, to determine that. We only can determine what is a, uh, a, a valid profession of faith. Okay, the other one is, uh, why can you say that the word, okay, so just in other words, there are still two categories, in Christ, not in Christ, and those who are only part of the visible church but, but apostatize were never in Christ. Uh, okay, why can you say that the word and sacraments are the only means of grace when the apostolic teaching uh, on, for instance, fellowship and prayer ties promises of blessings to these other means? Glad... Uh, that question was posed because uh, I, I didn't really uh, uh, deal with that here. Uh, well, I, I'll give you, without going into the details, sort of the standard textbook reformed answer to that. Uh, the means of grace are defined by the fact that they are God's work toward us, not our action toward God. So, there are many things. There are many things that uh, that we do that can uh, be a great uh, way of enjoying fellowship with God. Most notably, prayer. Uh, prayer is the first 
uh, expression of gratitude, the first cry of the, of the newborn baby, as it were. Uh, and uh, we enjoy our fellowship, but the, the means of grace are how God establishes that fellowship to begin with and how he sustains that fellowship. Baptism, the, Lord, the preaching of the gospel, baptism, and the Lord's Supper are actually Christ's acts toward us. He's making promises. He's creating faith through that promise. He's certifying that faith, confirming us in that faith through the sacraments. God is doing all the work. So if the subject of action is you, it's not a means of grace, it's a means of gratitude. If the subject of the action is God, it's a means of grace. That's, uh, for instance, Burkhoff would be a good place to see this in fuller review. Thank you. Well, we now have an opportunity for you and us to ask questions. As we've done before, there'll be microphones floating around. I'll just field the question rather than try and interpret it, um, and uh, we'll leave Mike. But look, hands are up already, so... Professor Horton, thank you so much for your lecture series and for today's lecture. I was particularly interested by what you were saying about the presence of Christ through the preached word. Uh, there was a lot in what you said, so I wondered whether you might be able to just re-articulate the precise sense in which Christ is presence, present through the preached word and perhaps whether you might be able to reflect on the, the theological relationship between Christ and the preached word and his presence being uh, the word Allah, John 1, and what have you. Great, yeah. Um, okay, again, here's just classical uh, Reformed categories, that are, uh, which is shared with Reformed and Roman Catholic other uh, uh, communions. The, uh, there is the hypostatic word, uh, God in his essence. And then... Uh, there is the sacramental word, God is in, in his energies. So the sacramental word, God in his, the word as a means of grace, is not God in his essence, it's God in his energies. The ancient fathers came up with that distinction using the analogy of the sun and its rays. The rays of the sun aren't the sun itself, but you also can't say that they're simply shiny things that the sun is shining on. They are the rays of the sun. And similarly, you can't say that the word of God, the church fathers specifically said the word of God here as, as, uh, as exhibit A. The word of God is not a creature, but it's also not of the divine essence, only Jesus Christ is. But it's from God. And so it's therefore to be called divine not because it is in its essence, but it is in its working, in its activity, it's divine. It's God speaking. Um, I think that's a really uh, helpful distinction. Obviously, if Jesus walked in here right now, we would all fall down and worship, uh, but I really hope nobody does that if I hold this up. Uh, you know, uh, this is, but nevertheless, we don't hear this as the words of men. We hear this as the word of God, through the words of men. And so it is, it is God's activity, but it's not God's essence. Uh, the result of God's activity, but uh, not God's essence. And that's how you separate, or not separate, uh, how you distinguish between preaching and scripture. Scripture is the result of God's energies. Preaching is God's energies. God in the act of speaking. Whereas scripture is the product of the infallible canonical preaching <laughs> that norms our preaching, that determines whether it really is the preaching of the word. And uh, as far as his presence goes, very quickly, I'll just, uh, you know the passage, but uh, where Paul says, contrasting the righteousness which is by works that tries to ascend versus the righteousness which is faith, he says, but what does it, the righteousness of faith, say? It says this, the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. See already the public nature of this. Publicly confessing. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now listen to his logic here. He's making a logical argument. Okay, if God comes down, then we don't try to climb up. We don't say he came down in the incarnation, but now we have to climb up and get him or descend to the depths to find him. Even now he comes all the way to us in his word. He climbs down the ladder every time the word is preached and places himself, or the spirit places him in our hand, makes him haveable. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? Could be translated whom they've never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? You see the logic? Sent from heaven, as it were, as the apostles were, even though there is no apostolic office, heralds are appointed, are, are, are ordained, are sent from God to, to proclaim this word and so we know that when they are sent from Christ himself, this is an objective word, that not because they're good people, not because I really like the way they raise their kids uh, and they have some good things to teach me about child rearing, uh, not because they are just really sweet or they're generous or what have you, but because Christ has sent them as another sinner to proclaim something from him for me. And for us, uh, I receive it as, as his word. Christ is that close, Paul says. He's standing right there making the promise to you in person. That is an amazing presence of Christ. The only way it can happen is by the spirit because he's not coming back bodily until uh, the second coming. But until then, mysteriously, how do we know? You know, this is, and this is what, what Calvin said about the supper. He says, uh, it would be inane to imagine that we could comprehend this. He says, I would rather adore the mystery than understand it. And I think that's true, too, with the preaching of the word. Just be grateful. This is how, that, that he is present. The Holy Spirit mediates the distance so that when the Holy Spirit takes what is of Christ and, and gives it to us, there is a real union there that is mysterious and ineffable. Thank you. Next question. Okay, Mark, we had a question coming through from Andrew online. Uh, thank you so much for all the wonderful things you've shown us today. You speak of the need to invoke the Holy Spirit when we meet. Are you saying we should begin our services with petitions to the Spirit or prayers to the Father and the Son for the Spirit to be active? Uh, the reason for the question is that the biblical pattern almost never directs prayers to the Spirit. Mm. Yes, good. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, one of the many uh, resentments the Eastern Orthodox have against uh, the Roman Catholic Church is that the epiclesis was removed in the Middle Ages from the ancient liturgy. The epiclesis is the part of the liturgy uh, that calls on the Holy Spirit to consecrate the elements. And the East said, always imputed, you never know how much to believe the East when they're criticizing the West. But, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of truth in every rumor. Um, that the West doesn't really need the Holy Spirit to consecrate the elements. The priest has already converted them through trans transubstantiation. I think they're absolutely right when they say that. That's a very shrewd, it's always nice to use the Eastern Orthodox against the Roman Catholic. Um, <laughs> Calvin, I'm, I'm kidding. I mean, not really, but sort of. Uh, Calvin explicitly brought the epiclesis back into the liturgy in, in Geneva. Uh, and I think that that was not just a, you know, he was rifling through 
ancient uh, liturgies and came up with this one. He wanted to restore the church, he said, according to the scriptures and the pattern of the apostolic churches. And so I think that, uh, plus his whole theology was the Holy Spirit is the one, again, who takes what is Christ and gives it to us now. How can you not ask the Holy Spirit to consecrate the elements? How can you not ask the Holy Spirit to bless the preaching of the word so that, uh, that, that uh, the people will uh, be beneficiaries of, of Christ's presence in grace and mercy? So, yeah, we have to, I think that it's, it's important that we, that we invoke the Holy Spirit. It's not, it, ordinarily, we pray to the Father in the Son by the Holy Spirit. But I think it's entirely uh, proper to either pray for the Father to consecrate the gifts through the, in the Son by his Holy Spirit, or just to pray to the Holy Spirit, who is, after all, worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son, um, to, to uh, pray directly to the Holy Spirit in the Son uh, to, uh, to bless the, uh, to consecrate that which is common and make it holy for his holy use. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Professor Horton, uh, thanks once again for an absolutely wonderful feast. Uh, mine is a more a technical question and for clarification. It's a long time since I've read Calvin's treatise on the Lord's Supper, but from memory um, he speaks of a true, real, realita and spiritual presence, but never uses the word um, substantiality, no substantial presence. Now, so my first question is, is my memory right, or do I need that corrected? And if it is right, then it seems to me uh, Calvin is putting a, a very great reserve on how we talk about or state the presence of the whole Christ to us. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate that. That's, um, well... <coughs> For, for Calvin, the emphasis doesn't really fall. He thinks that people are arguing too much about uh, the, the, the proper adjective for his presence. Cal, Calvin is happy just to say he is truly, really present. <laughs> he is truly present. The whole Christ is present and is truly given, not always received, but is truly given to everyone who, uh, who partakes. Uh, you know, you don't re if you don't receive the reality promised, then you don't receive it. But it is truly uh, well meant offer of the gospel. Uh, it's truly given. Um, the reason he doesn't focus on on uh, what in what sense he's present is he is that he thinks that that's the wrong place to 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 uh, draw the lines of of disagreement. Once you're not a Zwinglian or a Roman Catholic. So if, you're, if you really do believe he's there, don't know exactly how this all works, but we know that we truly receive him uh, through faith in these means. Um, if, we, if, we, if we hold that, Calvin even goes on to say, why, uh, why uh, de, uh, stir the churches into frightful commotion over how he is present when it's plainly a mystery? That's a direct quote. And so uh, what he wants to say, he just, as long as we say he's present by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, by his word and spirit, his promise and his spirit bound together, he's present. Um, and that's, that's what neither Zwingli nor Luther were saying as, clear, as, as clearly. Um, so it's by the spirit that he's present. So when, when he's saying manner is spiritual, and I, I forget the exact language of the 39 articles, uh, you would know it is, uh, we receive the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper, but after a spiritual manner, yeah. it's, but after the Holy Spirit, the spiritual manner is the Holy Spirit, it's not spiritual substance, what we receive is Christ, the same Christ, uh, in the words of the Belgic Confession, uh, uh, the crucified body and shed blood of Jesus Christ is what we receive in the Lord's Supper. But not after a carnal manner, it goes on to say, but after a spiritual manner. 
Um, so we're of the same view there. Um, the way we receive it is by the Holy Spirit. But what we receive is the same Jesus Christ who died on the cross, shed his blood for us. Please. Um, thank you very much. Just wondering, you don't have to, but would you be able to summarize what you were going to say about baptism? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, you may be alone here. There may, there may not be uh, many people who, who are happy with your question. Um, no, it's... it's uh, You know, let me, let me just say that, because this is true f- for communion too. Here's, here's an example of how important it is that we have a covenantal view of this. Koinonia is an indication of that. Koinonia comes from the world of covenantal arrangements. Here, here's an example. Uh, in ancient Near Eastern treaties, when a greater king was making an, uh, a treaty with a lesser king, uh, it would take the form, just kind of, uh, take my, my word on that. Ask, ask your Old Testament prophets if I'm correct. But uh, even in the form, it looks like a, uh, a suzerainty treaty from the ancient Near Eastern world. Um, so here's one for example. This, uh, this goat that we bring out, uh, this is a treaty between Ashenerari and Mati'ilu. This is, a, uh, this is not a, the head of a, of a ram. This is the head of Mati Ilu and his sons. If he should fail to keep the terms of this treaty, then they would slit the ram's throat. Say, may the same be done to him as was done. He says, this is not a ram brought out for a Geritu festival, which was religious. This is not a ram brought out for a Hitu festival or for is very clearly consecrating it, as it were, separating it from its ordinary use even its religious use, for a political use. That was considered the ratification of the treaty. When the ram's head was slit, Mati Ilu and his sons were assuming responsibility. Well, in Genesis 15, God passes between the the pieces, and he assumes responsibility. Very odd suzerainty treaty where the suzerain is the one who's walking between the severed halves, accepting responsibility, may this happen to me if this covenant isn't fulfilled, while Abram's sound asleep on a rock, which is usually when the best things happen, leaps forward in redemptive history, when patriarchs are asleep. God God puts them to sleep, and then he gives them these promises. Uh, So anyway, then, then we're, take that with you to the upper room. Jesus is standing there and he says, this is my body. This is no longer bread. This is my body. This is no longer wine. This is my blood. In covenantal language, what he's saying is not that it's transubstantiated. Any more than the head of that ram, anyone standing around thought the head of the ram was transubstantiated into the head of Mati'ilu and his sons. Rather, this, but it's also not just remembering It is an official ratification. The difference is Jesus now is saying, my blood shed for you. I'm walking between the pieces tomorrow for you. And that's what happens every time we receive the Lord's Supper in faith. Jesus Christ is placing himself broken and bloody in our hands as our sacrifice for sins. Not another sacrifice, but that once and for all sacrifice given to, uh, to the eyes of faith to more surely confirm what he's promised in his word. You might have to wait for the book for baptism. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't even stay away from the supper there. That's all right, there you go. This may well be our last question. Good morning, Professor. Uh, my question revolves around our use of the vocabulary of the Holy Spirit in our ecclesiastical practices because... It seems to me that the vocabulary of the Holy Spirit in our everyday parlance has become somewhat of a shibboleth to identify which side of the Pentecostal reform divide 
that you are on. So you meet a Christian you haven't met before, they talk about the Holy Spirit, you're immediately suspicious if you're from the Reform camp, that sort of thing. I, I wonder if uh, some of the stuff that you've been talking about earlier this week and actually properly understanding the role of the Holy Spirit and reclaiming some of that language and vocabulary that we see in Acts where they talk about the Holy Spirit sent us or the Holy Spirit says or as opposed to just the generic God, which I think we often use to try and avoid, uh, again, sounding like something we don't want to be associated with. Can you just maybe comment a little bit on, on the importance of that and how you see that functioning for us today? Well, let me see if I understand your question first of all. Are you, I'll answer what I think is your question and you tell me if this is right. The, um, yes, I think that we need to be more specific in the way we talk about the triune God. Uh, scripture itself does. And uh, I don't think we should be, be uh, overreacting here and never use the word God. But I do think that, that we need, especially in our worship, to single out the persons of the Trinity often and uh, their processions, the Son and the Spirit from the Father, but in different ways. Uh, eternally begetting, eternally, eternally proceeding. We need to do that, especially in the, in the service, in the liturgy. And the ancient church fathers really knew this well. Uh, Basil the Great says, uh, be sure and instruct uh, the, the uh, ministers to inculcate the, holy, the faith of the Holy Trinity not only in their lectures, but in their liturgy and prayers. Really important, because what I hear today, often, in evangelical prayers, even at, at our, you know, when I, I sometimes interrupt people, uh, students' prayers. I learned that from my boss. Um, now I'm just passing on the grief to another generation. But, uh, you know, just it, often I'll hear... Uh, and Lord, we just thank you. Uh, we thank you for, for uh, dying on the cross for our sins. Right. Right, who, are you, who are you talking to? Uh, to God. Well, you, you, normally we talk to the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. Are you talking to Jesus? Or are you, or are you talking to, well, I'm just talking to God. Okay, well, then you're a modalist. <laughs> And if you're talking to the Father, if you're talking to the Father, you're talking to the wrong person. He didn't die on the cross for your sins. He so loved you that he sent the... But, uh, and, then, and then the worst is, in your name, amen. Do you, hear, do, you, do you hear that here? I hear that all the time in the States, and it's just driving me absolutely mad. Uh, I think part of it... it because. It's not obviously in your name. Whose? There are three names. So what name? We're baptized into the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Spirit. Which name are you saying in, the name, in your name? Amen. It's certainly not the Father. We don't pray in the Father's name. We pray in the Son's name. Everything is in the Son. From the Father, by the Spirit. Anyway, uh, so I think part of it is once we've jettisoned uh, classic liturgy, I'm not talking saying just the age of it, you know. Uh, oh, the, the, you know, the Book of Common Prayer can't be surpassed because it came from the great 16th century Reformation. Um, but if we're going to have newer liturgies, let's realize, first of all, we do have liturgies. They're either good or bad. That's a good one. That's a really good one for inculcating the triune tri faith. So if you don't want to do that, there's nothing binding. But if you want to do it, replace it with an intentional liturgy that inculcates the Trinity that well. Because as your people pray, and as you pray, so they'll believe. And if we're not praying in a Trinitarian way, we're not, we're not believing in a Trinitarian way, and it won't be long before we are surprisingly, Unitarians. 
Sorry, that was a horrible note to end, to end with. A, what a warning to end with. But what, <laughs> why don't you take a seat for a moment, Mike, and we'll, um, we'll call you up in a second. Friends, uh, our lecture series is coming to an end. Uh, what have we enjoyed this week? Well, some, we're going to enjoy something in a moment, uh, but, uh, but we'll enjoy that as it comes. Uh, what have we enjoyed during this last week? I think we've enjoyed a rich feast of biblical teaching and serious theological reflection. Uh, we've enjoyed the lectures, haven't we? You've enjoyed them, yeah? Uh, but we've also enjoyed the warm fellowship, which is God's gift to us, fellowship with a brother whom many of us only knew uh, through his writing before these lectures. This is, it, is, it is ominous, isn't it? You've just got to pause and wait for it to happen. I don't think that's exactly what we're going for, but any moment now, something will come up on these screens. There you go. I understand on good authority, this is as he took his first taste of Vegemite. And we had thought about doing a, um, a caption competition. What on earth was he going to say next? Uh, but we could leave that one and see. We, we might even send him the results. But there you are. Uh, we've enjoyed the fellowship with Mike over this week. This is actually uh, from his time with the Presbyterians. They were the ones who introduced him to Vegemite, uh, which is a bit strange, but we'll leave that alone. Um, but there you are. Um, this is our brother who, whose fellowship we've enjoyed. I've learnt many things uh, this week. I've seen connections in the teaching of Scripture which I hadn't noticed before. And I'm sure that's the case for many of us, if not all of us uh, in this room, and uh, many of those who are listening uh, through the live streaming or who will listen to these afterwards. Uh, we've got much to thank God for in the 37th series of the annual Moore College Lectures. Uh, we have much to thank Mike for as well. Brother, we are very aware, well aware that a, a lecture series like this doesn't materialise out of thin air. Uh, it's the result of a, a very great deal of work, built upon decades of serious engagement with the teaching of Scripture. And we want to thank you. Thank you for all the work that you put into these lectures so that we here on the other side of the great pond uh, might grow in our knowledge and love of God. We know too that a, set, a lecture series like this comes at some personal cost as well. Uh, Mike has had to leave his family behind, uh, Lisa and their four children, and in their absence we need to thank them as well. And he's had to travel with uh, a significant degree of discomfort and inconvenience. And so we appreciate all that you've done to serve us. Uh, you and your teaching have been very gladly received. And we want you to know that. We're thrilled that you came and we've greatly benefited from your ministry amongst us. So thank you very much. Uh, we have some small gifts. We've just bought out the shop on Vegemite. Uh, <laughs> Not really. We have some small gifts as uh, are there for you and for your family, just as small tokens of our appreciation for all that you've done. I want to thank you again. Come and, come and receive them. And I'm sure I'm not alone in entertaining the hope that this won't be your last visit to Australia and to more college. So will you join me with thanking you. Thank you. It's almost as if we want the encore on the baptism, isn't it? But uh, we'll leave it. We'll, we'll, we'll. <laughs> I, I think he's just managed to sell at least several hundred copies of the book. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to pray and uh, thank God for what we've received, and uh, then we can go downstairs and share some morning tea together. While some of the students here might like to stay and help us reset the room, uh, ready for lectures for the rest of the day and uh, uh, this and next week. Uh, before I do that, though, just one or two announcements. Uh, next year's lectures will be held around this same time. They're, they'll be advertised on our website. And Professor Kevin Van Hooser from um, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School uh, in Chicago uh, will be coming to lecture us on the Protestant Solas. 
why Protestants should still sing solar 500 years on. Uh, so that's, uh, that's next year's feast for us. Um, the lectures that you've been enjoying uh, will be available on the website so you'll be able to go and listen to them again and again and uh, we'll see if we can find a way to get the pictures up there as well so that you can enjoy that moment again and again. <laughs> Friends, let's pray and thank our God for all that he's given us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy to us in the Lord Jesus. We do thank you, Heavenly Father, that you loved us so much that you sent your Son. And we thank you that you, together with your Son, have poured out your Spirit upon your people. We thank you for the Spirit given to us. And we thank you, uh, most of all at the moment, for this uh, series of lectures that we received. We thank you again for our brother and the gifts that you've given him. We thank you for the things that you've taught us and the way in which you've drawn us back to your word to hear there of you and of your purpose. And we pray, Father, fortified by that spiritual food of the truth that comes from you, we might live as we ought to live as Christ's people, bearing the fruit of your spirit to your great glory. And now we commend each other uh, into your hands. We pray for our brother as he travels from here uh, to Queensland and, and then home to America. Please keep him safe. And we do ask, Father, that uh, it might be your good purpose to renew our fellowship in the years to come. And all of these things we pray for the glory of Jesus, your son. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.